Hello and welcome to Eastern Roman History. The youngest daughter of Constantine VIII, Theodora grew up and was educated in the Imperial Palace during the reign of her uncle, Basil II the Bulgarslayer. Constantine VIII made inadequate provisions for his daughters so that his plans for succession were rushed. Theodora was originally supposed to marry the Eparch of Constantinople, Romanus Argyros, the future emperor, but refused because he was a relative or because Romanus was still married. Zoe married Romanus instead, making him emperor along with herself. In 1029, Theodora was suspected of conspiring with the Magistros Prusianus the Bulgar to seize the throne from Zoe and Romanus III. However, the plot was discovered and the Emperor had Prusianos imprisoned and blinded. Theodora continued to plot against her sister Zoe, allying with a coalition of the Do of Thessalonica, Constantine Diogenes, the father of the future Emperor Romanus IV, and other prominent officials. However, this was discovered by Imperial authorities and Constantine was in prison. The others were flogged, disgracefully paraded down the Messe and exiled. Zoe had Theodora interned as a nun in the monastery of Petrion, where she would remain until 1042. In 1032, Theodora plotted with Constantine Diogenes again and the bishops of Dyrrachion and Penthorion to help Constantine escape to the Western Balkans to raise a rebellion. Again, this plot was discovered. Constantine committed suicide by jumping off the Theodosian walls to protect his co-conspirators, having been tortured by John the Orphanotrophos. When Michael IV became emperor in 1034, he did nothing for Theodora because he hated her. With the death of Michael IV, Michael V, his nephew, became extremely unpopular after he exiled the Empress Zoe. A riot against his rule by a Constantinopolitan mob proclaimed Theodora Empress in opposition to Michael V. Michael had not dealt with Theodora in his bid to remove the Macedonian family from power because, as Celis reports, he did not even know who Theodora was. Michael Celis, an eyewitness, reports the entire episode. This extract retells the ascension of Theodora. Michael Celis, Chronographia, 14 Byzantine Emperors, Book 5, page 36 to 37. As I have said, the people revolted against the tyrant, but they were afraid their efforts might be wasted, for his force might get the better of them, and the affair might develop into nothing more than an uproar. Since, therefore, they could not lay hands on the senior empress, the tyrant had anticipated that move, and he was watching her with all the vigilance of a tax gatherer waiting to collect dues from a ship in harbour. They turned their attention to her sister. She was, after all, the second child of an emperor. There was no confusion, no disorderly tumult. On the contrary, they appointed one of her father's retainers to act as general at the head of their column, a man who was not a Greek by birth, but a person of the noblest character and a man of heroic stature, whose highborn ancestry inspired respect. Suter notes that this was Constantine Cabasilas. With this brave leader, they departed in force to find Theodora. Astounded by the unexpectedness of the sight, she refused at first to give way to their pleading and shut herself up in the church, deaf to every entreaty. The citizen army, however, giving up all hope of persuasion, used force, and some of their number, drawing their daggers, rushed in as if to kill her. Boldly they dragged her from the sanctuary, brought her out into the open and clothed her in a magnificent robe. Then they made her sit on a horse, and forming a circle all about her, they led her to the great church of Saint Sophia. Homage was paid to her, not now by a mere fraction of the people, but by all the elite as well. Everyone, with utter disregard for the tyrant and loud applause for her, proclaimed 
Theodora, Empress. At the age of 62, Theodora was crowned by the Patriarch Alexios and directed, along with a host of supporters, the rebellion against Michael V. Theodora and her supporters decided to blind Michael V and Constantine the Nobilissimus. This was to punish Michael's tyranny and thwart Zoe from deposing Theodora and rehabilitating Michael in the future. Zoe and Theodora ruled the empire jointly for three months in 1042. During that time, they purged the palace of the rest of Michael V's family. Theodora generously rewarded her supporters, but Celus notes that Zoe was excessive in her distribution of her largesse. One of the empresses, though probably Zoe, diverted money meant for the army and soldiers' donatives and gave it to sycophants and those who guarded the two empresses. Theodora and Zoe heard court cases and carried out the imperial duties as normal. It is noted that although they were joint empresses, Zoe did seem to be the senior empress in this alliance. The unity of the joint rule of the two empresses brought together the Dinatoi and the rest of the Senate briefly as a unified and stable government. George Maniakes was sent back to Sicily to finish his reconquest. Constantine Cabasilas was appointed as commander of the Western armies, and Nicholas the Eunuch became the commander of the schools of the East. Zoe and Theodora helped grow the monastery of Neamone on Chios. However, by June, Zoe, either from a desire to spite her sister, who, as Zanaris says, was far more skilled at rule, or because of Zoe's own sexual desires, she decided to remarry. She first tried to marry Constantine Artaclenes, but he was poisoned by his wife, as Glycus says, because she did not want to lose him to Zoe. Zoe then married Constantine Monomachos, whom was in exile at Mytilene. Thereafter, Theodora essentially took the third position in the empire, with Constantine the Ninth and Zoe in seniority to her. In 1043, John the Orphanotrophos was blinded, as Scylitzes thinks by Theodora. However, Zonaris thought that it was Constantine the Ninth in revenge for being exiled, or by Constantine at Theodora's request. Zoe died in 1050, Constantine died in 1055. In that year, Constantine the Ninth tried to make Nikiforos Proteon, the governor of Bulgaria, his heir. This he did in secret, but Theodora quickly discovered this, and with her advisors occupied the imperial palace. She persuaded the imperial bodyguard to support her. She used her influence to get the support of certain court factions, and she was born in the purple, giving her a legitimacy no one else had. She had Nikiforos Proteon arrested at Thessalonica and banished to Cusanus Monastery. At the age of 75, Theodora became Empress Regnant in 1055. She immediately confiscated the property of Nikiforos Proteon and his supporters, including John the Postal Logothete, and banished them. Theodora did not marry anyone as Zoe had, because she had seen how poorly Romanus III, Michael IV, Michael V, and Constantine IX had treated her sister. Theodora largely placed her own eunuchs in charge of many of the highest offices in the government. Theodora appointed Leo Paraspondylos, who had served Michael IV as her head of the administration. Italiates credits Leo as being both competent and benign in his administration. In addition, the Empress appointed Nikitas Sinelites, the Logothete of the Dromons, Manuel the Drungarios of the Vigla, and Theodore, domestic of the Scole of the East, sent him to check the raids of the Turks. She also took Michael Selos into her confidence and employed him as an advisor. Selos reports that an unnamed legal expert who had made great improvements in the law and outshone all of his colleagues was promoted to a top legal position, possibly nomophylax by Theodora. 
Theodora removed Isaac Comnenus, the future emperor, as Stratiopedarch because he had been a trusted official of Constantine Monomachos. She had Bryrenios, possibly Nikiferos Bryrenios, the Ethnarches, arrested and banished after he led his troops west to Chrysopolis. Once he was dealt with, his troops were sent back east. Bryrenios had already been ordered to the eastern frontier, and thus his action was mutiny. The Empress probably suspected that he wanted to take the throne for himself. There are several outcomes of her good governance and competence of her staff. There were no revolts during her reign. She did not debase the coinage and reduced spending, which had been a serious problem since the reign of Basil II. This can be shown in her refusal to distribute largesse or offer rewards to the army on her ascension in 1055 because, in her eyes, she had been empress since 1042. One of Theodora's acts was to investigate the heresy of the monks of Neamone. She also had to deal with Turgrul Beg, a Seljuk sultan who threatened the Byzantine Empire with war. However, Theodora was able to buy the sultan off by sending him gifts, horses and mules. This was enough to make Turgrul Beg stop threatening the empire turn his attention on Baghdad instead. However, though she diverted the Sultan's main force, the Turks continued to raid against Armenia. The Vardapet Aristakis Lastiversti recorded the event. Aristakis Lastiversti, the history regarding the sufferings occasioned by foreign peoples living around us, chapter 18, page 116 to 117. After the death of Monomachus, that lioness, the lion's frenzy was roaring in her lair, resembling what Daniel had seen in his vision in bygone times. Calling together the principals of the city and the very great princes, she said to them, If any of you is brave enough to take troops to the east, to end the turmoil caused by the Persians, and to pacify the land, then let him come boldly and sit as king. By God's laws, such a one is deserving of the realm. But if none of you dares do as I said, I am sufficient as a substitute. When the princes heard of this, without replying, each went to his palace. And the queen satiated the sultan as though he were a famished beast, giving him such a plethora of gifts that he forgot to attack us. Rather, he continued fighting in Babylon and the surrounding areas, since he was a very martial man. However, neither summer nor winter did those aroused neighbours of ours, or those whose borders marched with ours, cease coming and the sullying of the land of Armenia. For, by means of spies, they sought out and discovered where the populated places were. Then at night they would suddenly fall on them, and with unheard blows, put everyone to death. Unconcernedly and fearlessly, they would remain many days in one spot, till they had examined the houses to see if anything of value lay concealed there. They would remove everything, leaving the place totally demolished, and then taking the booty and captives, they would return to their own land. In 1056, there was a legal dispute between the monastery of Ivoron and the monk Cosmos Contolion over the Metachion of Mycelurgion, which she investigated. After shenanigans over the first investigation, Empress Theodora sent her officers again to sort the issue out properly. That same year in 1056, the patriarch Michael and Theodora fell out. He objected to the Roman Empire being ruled by a woman, and her appointment of Theodolus the monk to the Archbishopric of Bulgaria. Despite the opposition of the Patriarch and others such as Michael Cellus, her autocracy was tolerated. She likely prepared to dismiss the Patriarch before falling fatally ill. When she fell ill in 1056, her excretory functions broke down followed by a loss of appetite and vomiting, followed by violent diarrhoea. The top officials, including Leo Paraspondylos, 
Michael the Drungarios, Theodore, domestic of the Eastern Scholae, Nikitas the Logothete, and also Michael Selos, though he strongly disapproved of what he witnessed, schemed over who Theodora's successor should be, based on how easily they could control him. They settled on Michael Bringus the Old, stating that every decision he made had to be approved by them. They apparently asked Theodora to confirm their choice to get the Patriarch to back them. Treadgold criticizes Theodora for not properly designating an heir. Warren Treadgold, The History of the Byzantine State and Society, page 597. In this way, Theodora's death ended the ancient Macedonian dynasty without properly replacing it. In August 1056, Theodora died at the age of 76 years old, probably of appendicitis. Skylitzes called it a blockage of the bow. Though her reign was short, in total lasting nearly two years, her reign was one of competence and stability, a final echo of her heritage as a Macedonian, generally praised as a good ruler with a good and indefatigable nature by both contemporaries and modern historians. A singular failing was her lack of succession plans. This resulted in Michael VI Bringus becoming emperor, which led to civil war between him and Isaac Komnenos. Her reign is also important for two reasons. Firstly, and most importantly, she was the last of the Macedonian dynasty, a line that had held power since 867. Secondly, she was the last ruler to be born in the purple until John II Komnenos came to the throne in 1118. I have been your host, Daniel Maynard, and I hope to see you next time.